This week on the Laura Flanders Show, is a socialist future possible in America? We'll talk to two authors who think it just might be and speak to activists at the Democratic National Convention whom you might not have seen on TV. Stay tuned. Are we headed for a socialist future? Our next guests think it's possible, but what would that mean? And what difference would a tinge of red make to a green agenda, say, or a business plan? Sarah Leonard is a senior editor at The Nation magazine, as well as an editor at Dissent. Baska Sankara is the founder of Jacobin, a political quarterly offering socialist perspectives on politics, economics, culture, and just about everything. Their new book, co-edited, is The Future We Want, Radical Ideas for the New Century. I'm very glad it welcomes back. I can welcome back to the program, Bosker and Sarah. Glad to have you. Thank you. Let's start. I just want to take a second on your new issue of Jacobin, um, Bosker. came out this spring. It's dedicated to the Irish Rising of 100 years ago, the Easter Rising, so-called, of 1916. Why a special issue on 1916 in Ireland? Right. Well, the Easter Rising was a failed revolt against British rule in Ireland and had many different elements to it. There was a strong socialist component. The main overall commander uh, was uh, James Connolly, who's um, Ireland's foremost uh, Marxist and who was uh, later um, executed for his role in the, in the Rising. But in many ways, we thought that uh, rather than just thinking that of this as an Ireland issue, uh, we actually thought this had broader resonance. This is something that prefigured uh, the Third World revolts around, against uh, colonialism that happened later in the century. Um, and in many ways, it also, the, the failure of the um, Irish state that did emerge resembles in many ways the failure in the United States of us to also build a strong welfare state and a strong, strong social democratic movement. And without a strong welfare state and without strong social democratic forces, it's very hard to create a far left uh, to the left of that, when yeah. your your spectrum is just dominated by centrist and center right forces, which you have in Ireland and you also have here in the United States. Yeah, I mean it's fascinating to go back to 1916, a hundred years ago, and see how many people in how many parts of the British Empire and beyond were watching what was happening in Ireland and, and learning from it, um, from Gandhi to Lenin to W. E. B. Du Bois, I discovered recently. Um, the lessons that you draw of the current period are fascinating, though, too, in that Ireland went through a whole economic boom, followed by a real bust that is stirring things up in an interesting way. Right, absolutely. And just like you could say that today is probably the best time to be a socialist or any sort of radical in the United States since, you know, maybe the, the early 1970s, um, it's probably, you could say the same about, about Ireland. Um, because uh, a lot of the growth that was being pushed and this whole idea of the, um, the, the boom in, in Ireland in the 80s and 90s, it turned out to be just a mirage. It was yeah. based on you know, lots of fictitious capital on Ireland being a tax haven, and that's all kind of coming home to roost. And obviously Irish elites are doing just fine. They're putting their money elsewhere. They're investing in, in Europe. But their um, you know, average Irish workers and public workers and so on are finally beginning to uh, fight back against austerity. And it's actually very inspiring to see. And it's kind of paralleling, to some degree, um, the developments that we're yeah. seeing in the United States today. And are people watching internationally as much as they were 100 years ago? What's going on in Ireland? I think we need to rebuild uh, a kind of a strong international left that, that does have this perspective. Um, I think for sure people in Southern Europe and Portugal and Greece and Spain definitely regard the Irish struggle as, as part of their own and as, as a common uh, kind of adversary in the Eurozone and a lot of these policies have been pushed uh, continentally. Well, let's move on to the U.S. and your, uh, your other product, the co-edited book, The Future We Want, with the two of you. Um, Sarah, uh, it's true. This is a great time for these conversations. And they're the kind of conversations that people, I don't know, even 20, 30 years ago would have said would be unlikely to occur on U.S. soil because of the history of, of red baiting. What's changed? Absolutely. Well, a few things have changed. First, material conditions are such that people have not recovered from the recession. We're told we've been in recovery, but it's been a largely jobless recovery. And so people are still suffering. There's a large amount of student debt in the country, as we all know, a large amount of medical debt, and people really feel pressed. And people feel like their politicians or elected representatives are not listening to them, which turns out to be true. <laughs> people are not wrong about that. 
And so what you have is an enormous amount of need confronting a totally immovable political system, which is a very combustible combination. And at the same time, you have young people who came to political consciousness after 1989. So they're not really thinking about socialism in a sort of scary Cold War kind of way. Um, but did come to political consciousness around the time of the recession. So very likely a parent, a relative lost a job. Maybe their house was foreclosed on. Graduating college, they probably had debt. They very likely had trouble finding a job. And so people are not so afraid of socialists taking their stuff, mm. right? They're afraid of Wall Street taking mm. their stuff. And so there's a real opening for a new sort of politics that will actually meet the extreme need that we're seeing only growing in the U.S. I right mean, now. We've talked about this around your founding of Jacobin, Bhaskar, the, the shift, generational shift that you're talking about. Um, in terms of the willingness to even consider socialist options or communist. Um, what's the mission of this book? Uh, maybe is it the first of many? And, and who did you reach out to, Bhaskar? Well, uh, we reached out to a bunch of contributors from both Jacobin, The Nation, people we thought um, were obviously had a breadth of, of knowledge and experience, but were particular experts in, in one field. And we thought that we would, you know, take them together and put them in a book that offered kind of actual solutions. So the idea that we're actually getting it, we're not intending this to be used as a policy memo. We don't, we don't want to send this book to Washington and have, you know, the Congressional Progressive Caucus, um, you know, do try this. to enact, yeah, do this. Um, but Although this, we're fine with that. <laughs> yeah, if they want basic income, you know. Yeah, we, we'd be okay with it. But it was kind of meant as um, pushing back against the idea that a lot of people have that, you know, all right, you know, we don't like the status quo, we don't like the system as it is, but people don't believe there's an alternative and they believe that more importantly that the barriers to any sort of other system are technical. Mm. Like, in fact, we have homeless people because society can't be constructed any other mm -hmm. way. What we need to do as socialists, as leftists, as progressive, is push against that idea and tell people that the barriers to social change are political barriers, mm. not technical ones. And I think this book is a contribution in that direction. Now, your chapter in the book, Sarah, is um, specifically around gender and class. You call it sex class. And that gets at some of these questions very um, concretely. I mean, no class has been told more lies about the condition of their lives, I think, than women. And the first thing we're told is our problems are personal. Mm. You take that on. Yeah, absolutely. Well, one of the things I tried to address was first, what sorts of policies or what could we do on a society-wide scale that would benefit all women? Not just a few women, not just these or those types of women, but women in general. Um, and second, what would allow women to have enough political power that women's concerns continue to be at the forefront of social movements mm -hmm. that are trying to make positive changes? So something I focus a lot on is childcare. And the reason for that is twofold. First, um, it is a nexus of conflict between women currently. You have well-off women who are supposed to work a lot and middle-class women who are supposed to work a lot. Um, and they pay other women to look after their kids, often immigrants, often unprotected by labor unions, often at very low and exploitive wages. Um, and that's what we call having it all. Yeah, having it all. <laughs> There's lots it's, of people doesn't working it sound for you. good? Yeah. <laughs> you work all the time and you make someone else work all the time. It's amazing. Um, and so I wanted to get at what was going on here. And of course, um, in order for all people to be able to live complete lives where there is leisure time, there's work time, uh, no one's working for low wages, you need a large scale child care system. Mm -hmm. um, and this would do a few things. One, it would break that bad relationship between women that exists right now. Second, it would allow women to move to the forefront of work that is not in the workplace. So for example, the trade union movement has not always had women leaders in part because the women went home to take care of the right, kids. they're busy. Yeah, they're busy. They're working that second shift or maybe the third. And so by creating a context in which women are not tied to the home in the same way, you create stronger left movements. And finally, we should be thinking about children as a social responsibility mm -hmm. to privatize us, as Thatcher would say, right? The only unit in society is the family, um, the only important institution. What that does is it says, we don't need taxes to pay for childcare 
to take care of children as a society, we're going to throw that back on the family and you make do however you can. And so re-socializing that mm. is deeply important. Yeah, because it also shares responsibility. It makes us as a Absolutely. society realize, wait, this is work that a whole lot of people are doing, namely parents, Absolutely. Um, that the state has a huge dependence on, but no, is giving no support to. Yeah. Are these sorts of questions being integrated into left and socialist thinking outside of the circle of feminist leftists, Bosco? Yeah, I think they absolutely are of late. And I think the balance is between two extremes. Now, one is kind of a very old left approach that sees the main, you know, the, the only uh, thing to, to care about is kind of um, class exploitation, a class organization conceived of in a very narrow way around a traditional uh, working class. And the other extreme, I think, is to see them all as completely separate categories. And someone would say, you know, I'm an intersectional leftist. I care about gender. I care about race and I care about class. Mm -hmm. I think the approach in the book and what it, how it tries to integrate things is to say that separate um, oppressions are real and exist. And there are particular oppressions around racism and around sexism. But the common denominator in a lot of them is actually class. So class runs through them like a current. So you have to actually create particular programs to tackle um, things like sexism. But at the same time, if you try to create those programs without class, you won't get anywhere. In the time allowed, I want to get back to what you said was kind of the mission of sort of laying out some of the alternatives or possibilities that are out there. Uh, what difference does red make to, say, the green jobs agenda. Somebody writes about that topic. Well, I think for one thing, it acknowledges an actual agent, you know, an agent of history, an agent of change. And for that, you know, we think it's workers. But our conception of working class isn't, you know, you, ha you don't just have to be working a manufacturing job to be a worker. It just means you're a member of the broad mass of society that, you know, doesn't own a workplace, doesn't own a factory, is dependent on other people to earn a wage and, and mm -hmm. get by. And that describes most people in the capitalist world today. So we have not only a vision of a better world, we kind of have this idea of an agent that can carry it out. And more importantly, the idea that, you know, fights for reforms day to day can build the force of, of the working class to the point that they be able to win bigger and bigger gains. So when it comes to the environment in particular, I think you can have a liberal approach that says, you know, we need a sustainable planet. Right. But because they don't attach that dream to an actual set of people, they end up with policy that ignore the very people that they have to win over to actually achieve that change. So, for example, you know, if you want to uh, uh, decrease carbon emissions and, and do things like that, you won't do it by taxing and nickel and diming workers because that'll just anger them and tell them that, you know, a climate agenda is against their interests. But if you actually think about empowering workers and giving them the chance to democratically control, um, you know, so much of production and the world around them, then they'll actually realize, you know, this is in the interest of the majority. And hey, we don't own a, a factory. We don't own a coal power plant. So maybe it's in our long term interest to actually buy into this. Mm -hmm. But I think there's a very different approach that a lot of mainstream and liberal forces have that don't think about how to win over um, the actual mass of people. And that opens the door to right wing populism, who correctly identifies kind of contradictions and and liberal thought and, and rallies people around an agenda that you know, doesn't actually serve them, but at least it's counter to mm. this kind of um, status quo liberalism that they've seen the effects of for the past few years. So where do we go next? This election will eventually be over in the United States. Your book is out. Jackman continues. Where are you hoping these um, conversations will, will take us, Sarah? Well, People have been opened up to the idea of socialism. What's not clear is what everybody thinks that that is. Correct. Um, in many ways, it's a response, not an affirmative message. Um, and so we want to do the work, and this book is certainly part of that, of doing the educational work, um, doing the journalistic or even the research work to sort of build a comprehensive picture for people of this is what a socialist society could look like, this is what it's looked like in the past, this is, this is the sort of world we want to see. Um, and to begin doing that in some amount of detail. Um, beyond that, of course, organizing is the most fundamental thing. And I think that's going to take a number of different routes. So there are a number of social movements sort of already in play, whether it's around Black Lives Matter or Fight for 15, that have 
already created the opening that Bernie Sanders stepped into, mm -hmm. right? By suggesting the problems that we're facing right now, they're not your fault. They're not individual problems. They're social problems. And that is the room that Bernie Sanders stepped into. And so supporting those movements in their development is going to be absolutely fundamental to creating the further terrain for more socialist work. Thanks, Baska Sankara, Sarah Leonard. The book is The Future We Want, Radical Ideas for the New Century. Check it out. So from talking about making systemic change to working for that change, at the Democratic National Convention, activists from all over the country showed up with a much bigger agenda than just voting on a presidential nominee. A lot of what they tried to say was not covered elsewhere in the media, but we were there. Jonathan Klett and Anna Barsan reported on this side of the DNC for The Laura Flanders Show, thanks to your contributions that made it possible. that you might even help Donald Trump. Of course, you don't want to, no, but that's it. I believe the it. DNC helped Donald Trump. Well, the fear of Trump is great. We are even more afraid of disastrous climate change. They're not interested in hearing our concerns. They pay lip service to it. And unfortunately, that hurts our party. It divides us even further, and it makes us in danger of proto-fascism taking over this country. About all of us, not the one percent. Hillary is the one percent. She will not represent our interests. She will represent hers, like she always has. I'm not interested in the American dream anymore. I'm interested in all of humanity having access to a decent quality of life. We need to remember that we have more in common than we have in differences. A Trump presidency is the absolute worst situation that could happen. This is grassroots completely, so it's nothing to do with Bernie. Yielding to the billionaires and receiving a super PAC, her controlling mainstream media, 
she doesn't know what it's like to break through glass ceilings. She could probably just flick through a crystal glass and that's about it. This isn't about Hillary Clinton. This isn't about WikiLeaks or anything like that. This is about the corporate media. We're in the heart of the media. We're at the media tent at the DNC and this is still not being covered. What does it take in this country to have the values of the, and the interests of the 99% of the People's Revolution reported by the mainstream media? The heinous idea of the Navy using the beginning of the earth for warfare and its training to destroy the way of life, life itself, and to abrogate our treaties. Now I need each and every one of you to consider how they feel. Some of the delegates have gone inside with uh, solidarity with the Black Lives Matter presentation. Now they realize that they kind of have to do it because otherwise we're going to screw them over in November. Yeah, but, uh...